Okay, welcome to Introduction to Forensic Psychology. My name's Adele Forth. I'm going to be the instructor for this course. So this is the section A, the uh, live section. We also have section T, the online section or the televised section. So I am very excited to be here. I was one of your co-authors on your textbook and this is the first time I've had the opportunity to teach forensic psychology using the textbook I helped write. So uh, certainly that's exciting for me. I normally teach graduate level courses and a third year forensic psychology honor seminar. So now I'm teaching second year. So hopefully you're as excited as I am about the course. Are you? Yes? Okay, good. So this is me. You can find me in the low building just over there, next door. I will have office hours on Wednesday and Friday, so after class Wednesday and Friday. So if you want to come and see me to talk about how to become a forensic psychologist, anything about psychology, well not psychology, anything about forensic psychology, anything about criminology, criminal justice, I'm also part of the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Uh, come see me. I'd be happy to talk to you about careers, whatever. Uh, that's my email. You should all have a copy of the outline. It's also on WebCT. So this course, Monday, Wednesday, you obviously made it here, so you know where the course is. Uh, from 10 to about 11.20, 11.25, depends on how much I ramble. Uh, Section T, for those of you watching Wednesday evening, we are in 7B, so there's lots of extra seats. I think there's 150 in Section A, and I don't know, another 150 or so, or maybe a little more in Section T. So if you were in Section T, and you really wanted to be in the live section, come on down, right? There's lots of room here. Uh, I am going to do some in-class exercises. And I am going to ask you guys questions, so the more people in the audience, the better. Okay, so certainly if you decide, couldn't get into the live section because it was full, you want to come to Monday, Wednesday classes, you're more than welcome to come. Ways to view CUTV class material. Uh, this was given to me by the CUT, CUTV folks. So uh, certainly those of you in the live section if you want to replay, hear me more than you've heard me in class, or I said some pearls of wisdom and you didn't catch that quote, by all means, you can do one of the above. Okay, so you can also replay the lecture to get additional information. Okay, and so I'll leave that up there. Uh, certainly the people on CUTV, this is per uh, particularly pertinent because this is how you're going to access these live lectures. Now, for those of you who haven't been in CUTV classes before, you'll see a camera in the middle of the room. And I think sometimes, he told me his name, Kevin. Is that your name? Sure. Yes, well, okay. <laughs> okay, do you have an alias sometimes? Have you been arrested by the police at any time in the past year? Okay, well, we don't, want, we don't want to go on record if you... Okay, don't, say any, don't disclose anything more, okay? So you're going to pan around sometimes, right? No, uh, oh, I see. Okay, cameras on the wall. Who does that? Uh, Charles. Charles, are you up there? Oh, I guess so. Okay, Charles back, is back there. So he will be panning you. But that don't be inhibited. Ask questions. Because you know what? This is not broadcast till Wednesday. So if you say something, like if Kevin had disclosed that he had a criminal record and he didn't want the president to know that, we could um, delete it. Okay? So if you, you want to ask questions, certainly uh, don't worry. We can always delete it if you don't like the question. Oh. Okay. You are very fortunate to have two teaching assistants for this class. Uh, these are both, Heather Clark and Julie Blay are both uh, senior PhD students uh, in forensic psychology here at Carleton. So if you don't want to ask me questions, 
about honors, about forensic psychology, about graduate school. They are much closer in age to most of you. Uh, and they are much more going through the process. So if you want to find out more, certainly uh, they will be uh, individuals for you to um, talk to. The other issue is the, they, we're not going to have official office hours because what I've found in the past is no one comes. And the poor TAs sit there. No one shows up. So instead, it's going to be by appointment. So you can certainly email Heather or Julie and ask them, you want to come in and meet with them, or you can do whatever questions you have over via email. Julie's going to come up in a minute or two, and she's going to tell you a bit about herself. And Heather's going to come in next Monday, and she's going to introduce herself to you. Uh, so how to reach us? The best way to reach the TAs and myself is via email. I check my email, oh, I don't know, way too often. Probably like you, check your email way too often. Uh, I do get a lot of email. Uh, I do international training. I do lots of different, go to conference a great deal. So I get, oh, I don't, not that I'm bragging, but I get about 100, 150 emails a day. And a lot of them are junk emails, but I do still need to uh, go through them. So to make sure I don't miss an email from you guys, put Psych 2400. And that will jump you up to the top of the queue and say, important message. Okay, so just put Psych 2400 in the subject line, okay, and I'll make sure we'll respond. And the same thing for the TAs. Uh, you can also certainly, if you want to speak, don't want to use email for some reason, if it's some, you know, something personal, you don't wish to, to uh, communicate via the internet, you can give me a call at my office phone, and then I will certainly try to phone you back as soon as possible. Okay? So far, so good? Nod. Okay, so I'm going to ask Julie to come up, tell you about who she is, and a little bit about the discussion group. So apparently if I stand right here, you guys are supposed to be able to hear me. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? More nodding? This is a lively group. Uh, I actually recognized quite a few people from labs last year, so hello to you guys. I'm back. Uh, for you guys who don't know me, I started at Carleton uh, eight years ago as an undergrad in criminology, so I remember sitting exactly where you are now. Currently, I'm in the second year of my PhD, and I do research in psychopathy uh, with Dr. Forrest. So the only two other things I want to mention today, one was the email. That's the best way to get a hold of me. I use my email as a procrastination tool. I'm always on it. Uh, with that said, during midterm, sometimes I get way more emails than I'm used to, uh, but my general rule is that I'll always try to get back to you within 24 hours. So that after 24 hours, you can send me a reminder saying, Julie, did you forget about me? And my answer would be, absolutely not. Here I am. Um, the other thing is discussion. Very exciting thing we're doing in this class. Uh, starting next week, I'm going to be hosting online discussions through WebCT. They're completely voluntary, but I really hope you guys will take advantage. So I'll be looking for news clippings and news that has to do with the course content, and I'm going to post discussion questions, and then I'm really hoping that uh, we'll have an interaction amongst like, your peers and with me, so I'm hoping that that'll be something you guys take advantage of. Anybody have questions for me? Yes? The same day appointment. So for, if you can't hear for CTV, um, the question was, what's the length for same day appointments? I do have another job, so Mondays through Wednesdays, I'm not sure, but in the evenings maybe, if you don't mind meeting me in the evenings. Thursdays and Fridays, I'm, I'm here, so send me an email and I'll always try to, to so it's possible. Okay. Monday through Wednesday is harder, but Thursdays and Fridays, definitely possible. Any other questions? That's a good question. No? Okay, course content. We're going to be talking about forensic psychology, and this is the uh, psychology as it applies to the criminal justice system. Uh, some of you are going to be wondering about my slides, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, so really, this is a whole range of topics. So this is a really a survey course. I'm going to dabble in pretty much every area of forensic psychology. Okay, and so it may, some of the areas be, may be of more interest to you than others, but certainly you will have a very rounded view of uh, forensic psychology. So on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about police investigations. 
I will be bringing in someone to talk about geographical and pro uh, um, uh, psychological profiling. And it's on your schedule. So Natalie Jones, who is, uh, was in the police psychology lab here at Carleton, who's done research in the area of profiling, seemed to make sense. That's certainly not my area of expertise. Makes sense to bring her in. We're going to uh, talk about deception. And uh, we're going to do a fun in-class demo with Ian Broom. So I have a polygraph. And Ian Broom is, my, is the student, a PhD student of mine, who's using a polygraph in a study. So we're going to, and I'll tell you more about it in the class before, but we're going to see whether Ian Broom can detect someone lying. In, you know, sort of like a true real reality show. We're going to send some, a couple of you out to commit a crime, okay? A mock crime, let's be. And then we're going to, he won't know who, who, who's done the crime. And then we, he's going to hook them up to the polygraph, and you'll see their responses. And you're going to try to identify the perpetrator, okay? So if any one of you think you're especially good at beating the polygraph, I'm going to be asking for three volunteers. Okay? So you'll be coming up here, we'll hook you up and everything. So that's going to be fun. Eyewitness testimony, this is a big, huge area of forensic psychology, jury decision making, forensic mental health issues, we'll talk about all about fitness to stand trial, you know, mental state at the time of the offense, all of that. Sentencing, assessment for risk for violence. This is a big area for forensic psychologists, both experimental and clinicians. Violent offenders, domestically violent offenders, spousal assault um, uh, individuals and sex offenders. I will bring, be bringing in an uh, expert, one of my fellow colleagues, Kevin Noons, to give you the sex offending uh, lecture. He also teaches uh, 2400. And I've left the best for last. Julie mentioned she's working with me in the area of psychopathy. This is my area of expertise. Okay, so I study psychopaths. From little kitty psychopaths to teenage psychopaths to Carleton University psychopaths to those of you, not, not you, but <laughs> hopefully, except for maybe Kevin, who end up in the penitentiary. Okay, so I do a whole bunch of research in the area of psychopathy, and you'll hear about it, because I've given you two whole lectures on psychopathy, because it's so exciting. And then we'll, I will also throw in at the end young offenders. And then we'll have a course review. So I know one, all of you are sitting there saying, well, you know, it'd be nice if you give us your PowerPoint before we come to class. Is that what you're thinking? Because then we would know what's on the screen, and we'd know what you're saying, and then we could add the extra content. And I see that point of view, and I've had this, I had this debate, this discussion before, but, well, I don't want to do it that way. It's not that I don't want to give you my slides. I mean, you can have my slides. It's just I want to do it after the lecture. Okay, so when I go back to my office, I will put my slides up on WebCT. And this is actually, I think a better learning. You should be taking a few, few notes. But you can see what's on the slide. I don't tend to put too much on the slides. I'll, I'll try not to. And then you can look at them on WebCT tonight. Then you can re-watch the lecture on Wednesday night. And boy, everyone should be able to do fantastic in the course. Okay? Also, I ask questions. And what I found, if I have my slides, you have my slides, I'll ask a question, and everyone looks down, flips over and says, I wonder what she wants to hear. And I don't like that. Because I want to hear from you. Okay? Now, if, if, you, if you get really agitated and upset, and you start sending me a whole bunch of emails saying, I hate the way you're doing this, who knows? I'm pretty flexible. But let's start this way and see how it goes. Okay? Okay, textbook. You can buy it in a... a well... You know, to save money, we've been using this textbook for, what, two years now? And this is the third year for 2,400 classes here. So certainly there should be a lot of used textbooks out there. Uh, as I said, we decided about four years ago 
uh, that we needed a Canadian forensic psychology textbook. There were about three or four American textbooks. There was two from the United Kingdom. And we said, well, this is ridiculous. Canada is at the leading edge of forensic psychology, right? And you'll see this as we're going through, and you'll see the uh, individuals profiled in the textbook, these Canadian researchers. Uh, why don't we have our own textbook? So Joanna Puzzullo and Craig Bennell and I sat down one summer and said, okay, let's write a textbook. Well, it's a lot more challenging to just write a textbook, but anyway, we did it. And the end result was this, this textbook up here, or you, hopefully you will purchase it or get it used. So certainly, uh, any complaints about the textbook? We are actually just in the midst of writing the third edition. So this is a good time for you to give me feedback, what you like and don't like about the textbook. Because certainly uh, we're right now in the midst of rewriting the chapters and updating the chapters. So you can have a major influence on what it looks like uh, when it comes out in a year and a half from now. The other thing I would recommend, I th it says required in your course outline, but of course if you don't want to buy the study guide, you don't have to buy the study guide. So this study guide gives you summaries of what's in the chapters. It gives you practice multiple choice items and the answers, and practice short answer. Uh, so certainly if you're wanting extra resources, you can you know, buy the study guide. I put two copies of the textbook on reserve in the library, so if you don't you know, you're forced to take this course, even though you know you're going to love it, but let's say this is a required course and you're forced to be here. You don't want to buy the textbook. You can get access to it in the library, and I put one copy of the study guide on reserve in the library, so certainly you can get access to it there. Uh, Midterm exams on Saturday. I don't have a choice with these dates. I mean, for when you're on CUTV, you must either, you have a choice of Friday evening or Saturday during the day. So, I didn't have a choice for the time of the class either, but this, this time's perfect. So certainly your exam is this, this time, that's set. So you, all of you will be there, plus the other 150, 160 Section T uh, students will be writing the exam. And it'll include weeks one to five, so including today's lecture. Okay, so, uh, and that's in your course outline. You have all that information, so you can write down or record that you're going to have to come to the university on Saturday, October 24th. The final exam, during final exam uh, time slots, I don't know when it will be, December 9th to the 22nd. Okay, so, so hopefully not the 22nd, but again, I have no control over when the final exam slots are. And that will include weeks 6 to 13. So you, you, can, <laughs> you do the midterm and then forget about weeks 1 to 5, and then focus on weeks 6 to 13. Okay, so if you add that up, that comes to 95%. So 95% of your course mark will be based on the midterm and final. But... We're going to have two quizzes, and these will be quizzes that will occur online, right? So to get you to start the A, to become more accustomed to the multiple choice style or format that I use, and to give you an opportunity to start learning the material sooner rather than waiting to the midterm, because I know I used to do that. So you guys won't, right? So there'll be a quiz available to you from October 5th to the 9th on WebCT. So any time between October 5th and 9th, that quiz will be available for you to go ahead and uh, do. It will be open book, but you're only going to have an hour. So it's not the case you'd have your book there, your PowerPoint slides there, your study guide, and hopefully you can answer all the questions in an hour. It would be better for you to read all the material first, do a, you know, a mini study session for the quiz one and quiz two, and then open up the quiz and go ahead. Okay, does that? And so I would suggest you write both quizzes, right? You have lots of time to do it, right? Five days to, to decide. Now, you only have one chance. 
So you can't start the quiz on Monday, come back to it on Wednesday, and finalize it on Friday. You have one chance, so make sure you have a full hour of free time, okay, that you won't have interruptions, that you can sit there and do the quiz. Okay, and they will be multiple choice, that quiz. And there will be similar type of questions that you'll see on both the midterm and the final. I will take the highest mark of each quiz, whichever quiz is higher, and that will be worth 5% of your mark. Okay, everyone? Okay. There are no makeup quizzes, because you have a whole five days, so if you're sick on Monday and Tuesday, you can do it Wednesday and Thursday. Okay, so I'm not going to have any makeup quizzes for this. So if you miss, or you decide you're not going to bother writing these quizzes, you'll get zero out of five. Five, you know, for the five percent of the final. Okay, any question about the quizzes? This is all going to be on WebCT. You need to sign on to WebCT. That's where Julie's going to run the discussion groups. That's where I'm going to put the announcements. That's where my slide's going to be, etc. So you need to get on WebCT because that's where you're going to get access to these quizzes. Okay? Now, to engage you even more, I'm going to have bonus marks. So these are freebies, so there's no reason why you shouldn't do these. Okay, there's going to be seven assignments up on WebCT, and these assignments relate to course content. Okay, so assignment one is just a practice quiz. It's going to cover information uh, that I uh, talked about today's lecture. Okay, 20, 20, 20 items. If you do the quiz, even if you get all the items wrong, you still get your one mark. Okay, so these are not marked. I just want you to get, so, I mean, hopefully you don't get them all wrong, but anyway, I'm sure you won't. But a lot of these other assignments relate to going to websites, like the Ottawa Police Services website, and finding information about if you want to become a police, officers, police officer. So that's the second quiz. There's a quiz on jury decision making. There's a quiz on risk assessment, sentencing survey, psychopathy. Okay? So you only need to do four of the seven to get your four bonus marks. Okay? So if you get a score, let's say you get a grade in the course of 78, a B plus. If you've done those four bonus marks, those four assignments, I will automatically give you an A minus an 82% in the course. So literally, it's foolish, personally, not to do these assignments. Right? They'll take you from 10, 15 minutes, maybe at the max, half an hour. Right? You can do them at home, whatever, wherever. So they will be released on WebCT tomorrow. So tomorrow evening, if you have a lot of time, you can get free four bonus marks right away in the course. Okay? Uh, assignment number seven is going to be a course feedback, and it's not going to be available to you until mid-November, because you have to at least hear me lecture, and you have to, right? So there's one that won't be available to November. All the other six will be available tomorrow for you to do. And it's going to be like a sentencing survey, your, 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 you know, get, getting information from you about what you perceive in terms of the Canadian justice system. The reason that the quizzes are, there is due dates, and in your course outline there are due dates for the quiz, I mean for the assignments, also for the quiz, but there are due dates for the assignments. These assignments are due prior to me talking about an issue. Okay, for example, psychopathy. Your assignment relating to psychopaths is due prior to this so that I can incorporate information from you into the lecture. Okay, so that's what I will do. I'll be giving you feedback from your answers into the lecture. Okay, does that make, is that clear? Okay, this is the first time I've done WebCT assignments. So hopefully they're not going to be, I don't mess up too much. But anyway, we'll see how it goes. I was supposed to release it today according to your outline, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I got on my uh, phone, I phoned someone over in EDC, and they've told me what to do, so I'm after class, I'm going to see if I can figure it out. Okay. 
Okay, grades. You'll be posted, midterm grades will be posted on WebCT. You should always check to make sure you get your midterm final grades are, are received and posted. When there's 300 or 350 students, sometimes things, you know, get mixed up. Hopefully not. Uh, multiple choice exams. Uh, in the, as I mentioned in the study guide, you have lots of uh, example multiple choice exams that are taken from the instructor's uh, manual. Okay, so items direct, taken directly from my test bank that I'll be using. So it shouldn't surprise you if you do these multiple choice ex, um, uh, questions in the study guide, you will likely see some of them on the midterm and final. I will be including the content. You have four guest lectures this fall. So the content of those will be included in the... Uh, the midterm and the final, and you will need to write both the midterm and final to get a mark in this course. Since the final doesn't co cover the whole course, you do need to write the midterm and final. So you miss the midterm, you're deathly ill. I don't know, that pandemic that might show up and everyone that can't get out of bed, whatever. Okay, you need to notify the teaching assistant either Julie or Heather within 24 hours. So if you're lying in bed, hopefully you can still email. Uh, we'll allow you to do a makeup. The teaching assistants will uh, arrange a time for you to come to campus and write the midterm. Okay, so you do need to make sure you write the midterm or you will not pass the course. Okay, now certainly if you're ill and you can't come, you will need a physician's note to document that. Uh, in the case of bereavement, if someone close to you passes away, you will need some documentation for the TA in order to write the midterm. So it's not that, well, this, is, this is more, happens more in February, right? I'm heading off to Cuba, right? It's, I, mean, I want to get out of the cold weather type stuff. None of that will, will work. When you have 350 students, we need to make sure it's manageable. I only have two TAs for this course. So if, you know, 50 or 60 individuals don't like that October 24th, date, this becomes very difficult to reschedule 30 or 40 people. So my assumption is that you'll all be there on the 24th unless there is di you're in dire straits. Okay, uh, okay miss final exam. I don't have anything to do with final exam. If you miss the final exam, you have to go to your registerial service uh, in the major that you're registered in. Okay, so if you're a, a FAST student, you're a psychology or sociology, uh, if you're a, a law, criminology, you'd go to a faculty of PA. Okay, so depending on your faculty, uh, that's where you'd go and you, they uh, to ask for a deferred. Okay, we're almost done the course outline. Uh, students with disabilities, certainly if you have a disability and you have an accommodation from the Paul Menton Center, you, that, I will be receiving that via email and we will make special accommodations for you. So if you need special accommodations for the assignments or the quiz, you do need to contact me if you're a Paul Menton student. Okay, and certainly then that won't be a problem. Uh, if, if there's some issue related to religious observance, you can't write the quiz during that October 5th to the 9th. Hopefully I haven't conflicted with any major religious holidays or October 24th. Hopefully I haven't done any conflicts there. You need to contact me and let me know. And if you are, for the females in the class, or out there, if you're pregnant, or you become pregnant, uh, you should certainly contact me if this causes a problem for the date for the midterm. Okay? Any questions about the course outline? I hear people talking out back there. Any questions? No? Okay. Now this is pretty, we're studying forensic psychology. So, one thing I study in students, remember I told you I study psychopaths. One thing I study is antisocial, Ill illegal behavior in students. So when I look for a psychopathy, I say, well, what would be an interesting correlate of psychopathy in Carleton University students? Can anyone guess what I might look at? Psychopaths. What might I look at in behaviors in students? Come on. 
Does anyone know? Bad behavior. Yeah? Oh, yeah, well, you know, yeah. Okay, if you guys are hostile and aggression, aggressive, yes. Impulse, oh, good, impulsive. But think of behaviors you do only at the university and school. Oh, I hear it. They say it louder. Plagiarism. So plagiarism and cheating. So I study the connection between psychopathic traits and engaging in plagiarism and cheating. So... You may be an interesting participant in my study, should I catch you cheating? Okay, I'll say, aha, do you have some psychopathic traits? <laughs> There's a whole blurb that I was told to put in about plagiarism and cheating in your course outline. That came from the university, I didn't create it. And they, they're really quite nasty, saying that you could get a zero on the assignment, you could get a failure in the course, we could suspend you from all your classes, we could throw you out of the university. Okay, so a whole bunch of bad things. Harsh penalties. So the other, okay, so don't cheat is the moral of the story. Okay, we're going to go uh, soon into the course content. But before I do it, I thought I would introduce to you the forensic faculty. So Shelley Brown, some of you may have taken her Arts 1 course. She's one of our newer faculty members. Well, she's been here three years. Uh, she studies gender. So again, if you are interested in one of these topics, uh, Carlton has one of the biggest forensic psychology pro program in Canada. The only other university that has the same size in terms of faculty is Simon Fraser University. So Simon Fraser is one, air, one university that has six forensic faculty, Carleton's the other. No other university come close. So we're vying against Simon Fraser University in terms of numbers. But I personally, now of course you can go to Simon Fraser and ask them, think we are much more diverse. Okay? So we've got Shelley Brown, and all of us are located on the fifth floor of the lobe. So if you wander around the fifth floor of the lobe, you'll find Shelley's office and the rest of our offices. Shelley Brown studies psychology, uh, and psychology and crime from a feminist or gendered point of view. She's looking at uh, female youth and female adults and why and how they commit crime. So if you're really interested in female offenders, uh, certainly go talk to Shelley. We have Kevin Nunes, hired the same time as Shelley, so three years ago now. Kevin News teaches the other section of 2400. So if you want to leave my section and go to Kevin's section, I think it's on Friday afternoon or, or 11.30 to 2.30. He's also using the forensic psych textbook. So Kevin News uh, it does research in sex offending. He's the person who's going to come in and give you a sexual offending uh, lecture. He does research in the area of risk assessment of sexual offending offenders and attitudes and cognitions with sex offenders. Okay, so if you're interested, in, I was going to say in sex, but let me rephrase. Interested in learning about sexual offenders, he's the one to go to. Uh, Craig Bunnell, uh, he is the other co-author on your textbook. He does police psychology. So he, took, he uh, wrote this, the textbooks or the chapters on investigation, interrogations, confessions, etc. He has a police psychology lab here, very active lab. Uh, he also has done research in the area of geographical and psychological profiling. So Natalie Jones, the person coming in to uh, give your guest lecture on psych psychological profiling, worked with Craig Bunnell. Okay, so interesting policing, use of force, training police officers, etc. Go see Craig. Joanna Pizzullo is the other co-author on this text. She's uh, been here. I've been here at Carleton the longest. I'll get to that in a second. But Joanna Pizzullo, she's the director of Criminology and Criminal Justice. So those of you in CRIM, she's your, the institute director. So if you have any issues about criminology, go see Joanna. She's right in the office beside mine. She does research in child witnessing, child witness, jury decision making, and... Uh, what else? Oh, lineups. Please lineups. Right? Is sequential or simultaneous lineups uh, more effective in terms of ident identification? There's myself. I've been here the longest. I've moved here. 
Uh, from UBC, I did all my undergraduate, my master's and PhD at UBC. I graduated as one of the first graduates in forensic psychology in 1992, so I started working here at Carleton before I graduated with my PhD. I've done all of my research in the area of psychopaths. So I would like to give you the entire 12, 13 weeks talking about psychopaths, but that would, you know, you might not be as excited about psychopaths as I am. So I won't do that. I'll leave it to the end and talk about my research in the area of psychopathy. Uh, and then we have Ralph Saron. He's our newest faculty member. He was a correctional psychologist. So if you want to find out more about correctional psychology, he worked in the field in Kingston, in some of the major penitentiaries down in uh, Kingston, Millhaven, Joyceville, etc. He also worked in, in policy at Correctional Service of Canada. So if you really want to, and he's, he's both, he's a clinical psychologist, clinical forensic psychologist and a researcher. Okay, so if you want to find out more about correctional psychology, jobs in corrections, working, doing treatment assessment, he's the guy to come see. I have one of his senior PhD students coming in. He's starting a whole new research project on desistance. Why do offenders stop committing crime? There's very little coverage in your textbook. I think there's like one box in your textbook. So he's not covered in much detail. So I'm asking him, his student Caleb, to come in and give you a lecture. Okay? So uh, certainly what I'm going to be doing now is I'm going to start going through what's in Chapter 1. I, don't, I know I only have about uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, so we'll see how far we get. Uh, but first, okay, first, what I want you to do is I want you to introduce yourself to the person next to you. Now, if you're best buddies with the person next to you, okay, just a minute, oh, stop, 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 slow down. If you're best buddies, then, you know, turn around and introduce you to the, uh, to the person behind you, okay? Now, I, I, I have my shaking hands. That's a big no-no. Don't shake hands, right? We're supposed to bump elbows now? I don't know. That's what they told me. You're supposed to bump elbows. So no, no, okay, no hand-to-hand -hand contact. How's that? Okay. So I want, just a minute, don't, don't, I'm not finished yet. Name, major, you can disclose one personal piece of information, not too personal, and one forensic interest of interest, okay, forensic issue of interest. I don't know, serial killing, whatever. Okay, now I will disclose, just a minute you guys, you guys are too keen. I will disclose my personal piece of inf interest, okay? So... I have a cat. Okay, so we've got some cat lovers here. Yeah? Okay, so that's a cute little cat. But some people don't like cats. So I have two German Shepherds. Oh, I know. Offenders don't like German Shepherds. They're cute. That was a long time ago. That was when they were little puppies. They're now four, four or five years old. So now, the other thing I have, now don't say they're rats, because you will offend me. They're kind of smelly, they're kind of psychopathic, they're hard to train, they're fearless and impulsive. I have four ferrets <laughs> that I got four weeks ago. And, oh, I know they're cute, aren't they? It's like to anyway, don't ask me why I have ferrets, because it will take too long. Okay, so go ahead and introduce yourselves.
you've got to know each other. Obviously, the noise in the room went up, Scott. That's good. Because every class, uh, we have one more time where I'm going to ask you to uh, turn to the person beside you to do something. So even though this is CUTV, we're going to do in-class exercises. So you now know someone in class. This will also be helpful to you should you have to miss class for some reason and you want to know what happens in class. So today, this is what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about the difference between what's the definition of forensic psychology. You need to know, I mean, here you're taking a course on forensic psychology. It would be good to know what it is. Uh, and this is all in Chapter 1. So in less than 40 minutes, I'm going to cover what's in Chapter 1. Now, clearly I'm not going to cover everything in the textbook because why should you... I mean, you can read the textbook. I'm not going to cover everything exactly what's in the textbook, so you might as well just stay at home and read the textbook. So I will take parts of the textbook. I might enhance coverage of different aspects, so it's not going to be exactly... I uh, hope I won't convict, could be, uh, conflict with the textbook, but I'm not going to cover everything that's in the textbook. I want you to recognize that forensic psychologist involves research. I'm a research forensic psychologist, so is also those colleagues I introduced to you. But it also involves professional practice of forensic clinical psychology. So there's two major streams of uh, forensic psychology. I want you to become familiar with what do forensic psychologists do, both in terms of experimental and uh, in terms of professional practice. And I'm going to give you a little history lesson about forensic psychology. And hopefully, that will bring us to the end of the class. Okay, so what is forensic psychology? Now, it might seem odd. It last, what, five, eight years, there is an amazing number of programs on TV that, I don't know, Profiling, Criminal Minds, CSI, Law and Order, Cold Case Files, etc., 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 which sort of portrays or does portray the forensic psychologist almost as being involved in crime scene investigation. So I would like to tell you that I go out to crime scenes or that I'm hired by the behavioral science unit of the, uh, the RCMP or even the FBI and I go out and help them find serial killers or serial arsonists or serial murders. The answer is we don't. Sorry. So if you want to do that, you're in the wrong place. Well, you're not, you, you no, no, you don't say, say don't go. But you need to be in law enforcement, okay? So many of you might want to be going on to law enforcement, so you might still be in the right place. But as a forensic psychologist, we don't do what they show on TV. Or maybe one or two percent of us do some of that by a consultation, okay? Uh, do we analyze blood splatter? I'm glad I don't. I don't do that, no, and no, and DNA. Often forensic psychology gets mixed up with forensic <coughs> science. Forensic science or ke is chemistry, physics, biology, as it relates to the legal system of solving crimes. So those people who do blood splatter, do velocity, velocity of, of uh, whatever, who look at DNA in these cold cases, those are forensic scientists, not forensic psychologists. Okay, so that's not what we do. The origins of the word forensic comes from the Latin. Now, this is not in your textbook. I didn't write ch chapter one. So I will go to my colleague and say, this is interesting information. Why didn't you put it in the textbook? But anyway, he didn't. So forensic psychology comes from the Latin word forensis, which comes from the means of the form. So those of you who have traveled to Greece, they've gone to, uh, to Rome, and... Didn't I make a mistake? Where's Rome? Rome is Italy. That's right. I'm glad you corrected me. See, I, I... Wait, so if you go to Rome in Italy, don't go to Greece. I was just in Greece. That's why I was thinking of Greek. Uh, you go to Rome, you'll see the form. The word means of the form. In ancient Rome, this is where individuals went to resolve disputes. Okay, so if you had a dispute with your neighbor, you would go to the forum and that's where they would resolve disputes. So it's the same sort of idea. We go to courtrooms nowadays and to resolve uh, disputes. Okay, in your textbook it talks about the narrow definition and the broad definition of forensic psychology. 
And the narrow definition, if we use the narrow definition, I would not be determined or I would not be classified as a forensic psychologist. So the narrow definition focuses on those individuals with a clinical psych degree who engage in the professional practice of psychology. So uh, I guess maybe on law and order, sometimes you see experts testifying in court, or when you read the newspapers, you'll hear about experts testifying in a particular case. Those experts tend to be forensic clinical psychologists. And I'll come back to how you become a forensic clinical psychologist. So this is we're doing um, assessments on individuals who get involved in the court system. And then typically you're going to provide that assessment either to some decision maker, right? The judge testifying in court for the jury, providing information for the National Parole Board whether to release someone, yes or no. Okay, so that's the professional practice. Okay, so I gave an example, evaluating a person to determine if they're mentally disordered at the time of the offense. So you commit a crime, and you commit the crime because you're psychotic at the time, you've lost touch with reality, I don't know, let's say you kill your neighbor because you think your neighbor is poisoning your water, so you act in self-defense to kill that person, there will be an evaluation to see whether or not you were mentally disordered at the time of the offense. Psycho a, a, a clinical forensic psychologist would be involved. Okay, does that... Okay, so I, 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 I'm not a clinical forensic psychologist. So I don't do those sort of evaluations. And I, I will, um, if you ask me questions, I can tell you that, I, yes, I have been an expert, but why don't we wait till I talk about psychopaths? And I'll tell you about why I got called to court in the area of psychopathy. I have been declared an expert in one specialized field, and I do do assessments in that one specialized field. Okay, the broad definition. And this is the definition that's used in this book, is that forensic psychology, yes, it includes the clinical professional practice of psychology relevant to the legal system. And typically, when we say legal system, we mean civil and criminal. Okay, so civil system would be child custody evaluations, okay, personal injury evaluations. So forensic psychologists also engage in those sort of uh, evaluations on the civil side. We are not going to be talking about those uh, in this uh, course. We're going to focus more on the legal end of uh, the clinical uh, practice. But there's a huge number of you know, researchers at Correctional Service of Canada, at uh, public policy, at colleges, at universities, at research institutes, institutions who are not doing private practice or pro professional practice. We're doing research, right, that's directly relevant to the legal process. So I do research trying to understand psycho uh, psychopaths. I've developed assessment <laughs> techniques to identify psychopaths. Okay, so that's the difference. And this, is, this responds to a huge number of individuals. Okay. I like this definition that Tom Grisso has, and I believe it's in your textbook. Uh, friend, a forensic psychologist is any psychologist, experimental, like myself, or clinical, who specializes in producing, producing so doing research, or community, communicating psychological research or assessment information intended for the application to legal issues. Okay, this is really broad. Okay, so the roles of a forensic clinical psychologist. Okay, they're going to focus on mental health issues. They will do risk assessments, I've already mentioned, divorce and custody uh, assessments. So that would be on the civil side of forensic psychology. Determine whether you're fit to stand trial. Can you communicate with your counsel adequately or not? Uh, mental state at the time of offense evaluations. The, these individuals will do, uh, provide treatment in penitentiaries or prisons. 
or youth facilities. So they're the ones that do the group treatment, the cognitive behavioral treatment, and they will help in law enforcement selection, uh, provide crisis management for police officers, etc. Okay, so this is just a sampling of what they do. I mean, I could go on for about half an hour saying here's the domain of, of research, or, or uh, sorry, here's what clinical forensic psychologists do. So in order to become a clinical forensic psychologist, if you want to be, you do need to go on to get your graduate degree in psychology, but not only in psychology, in clinical psychology. Now this is the most challenging and difficult program to get into, right? So if you want to be a clinical forensic psychologist, you like the idea of testifying in court, you want to provide treatment to your adolescent offenders, sex offenders, substance abuse offenders, that's what you'll need. And then you'll get, you have to get registered in the province where you want to practice. Okay? So it's going to take you, you get your honors degree in psychology, typically, or if you're in CRIM with a psych concentration, you get your degree plus six years at graduate school plus one year of forensic uh, pra uh, internship. So seven years. And then you also have to write an exam. It costs about $1,000 to write this exam to be registered. Then you can hang up your shingle in the yellow pages saying, Forensic Psychologist, open for business. Okay, so you don't want to do that. You can be Experimental Forensic Psychologist. So this is where you look at developing risk assessment tools. Okay, so if you want to say, Oh, let's pick on Kevin. So Kevin is, oh, I don't know, he's some sort of criminal, and let's say he's in jail, and we want to say we want to release him, but we want to know if he's going to commit another offense. So I'm going to develop a risk assessment instrument to tell me the likelihood he's going to commit another crime. And I'm going to do all the research on that to, to, to identify the, the best risk assessment scale out there. I may want to evaluate Program, okay? So you develop a program to treat, oh, sex offenders, okay? And you think you've got a fabulous program, and you think it really works. Well, you might think it works, because you're, you know, but the rest of us might wonder if it works. So I may evaluate your sex offender program. Deper determining the personality correlates of crime. Right? What is connected to crime, or what, is, what types of personalities engage in more crime? How's crime developed, looking at developmental aspects? Eyewitness testimony aspects, looking at research, looking at what will increase or decrease the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Again, each of these areas in the textbook, there are re there's research being done. So this textbook is very heavily oriented to empirical research. Right? We're in psychology. Well, this is a psychology course. I'm going to talk a lot about research relating to these areas. Okay, so you need a graduate degree in uh, psychology. Uh, and then you should, con con you probably will be working with, like Julie, she works with me. She's doing a PhD. She did her honors CRIM, concentration psych, came in and did a master's with me. And she's now doing a PhD. She She's now working. She told you she's working Monday to Wednesday. She got hired on at a federal government uh, uh, office who does, does, does research. I don't say the name because she, she doesn't want me to, but anyway, she that does research uh, in forensic psychology here in Canada. So even before she's finished, she's got a job. Certainly in the area of forensic psychology, none of our graduate students have problem getting jobs. There's a huge demand. This is unfortunately what we could call a growing area. There's tons and tons of jobs. Okay, the other, in the book it talks about uh, the forensic psychologist at least. So these are individuals who look at policy, legislation, changing policy. Let's say that if the Youth Criminal Justice Act changes again, they might be uh, consulting with committees at the government, government level, the ministry level, about making changes. Okay, so anything about surrounding changing the criminal code, changing legislation, 
This is probably the smallest component of what people do in terms of forensic psychology. Again, you need a graduate degree. Uh, when I, typically, when I say a graduate degree, sometimes a master's, but typically a PhD. There are more and more programs now offering joint law degrees and psychology degrees. So if you really want to become a legal scholar and work in policy, right, uh, in the government at the, either the provincial, territorial, or, or federal level, I would strongly recommend you look at for going to those universities that have a joint degree. I said universities, there's only one in Canada. The only university that has a joint degree in law and psychology is Simon Fraser University. You can get your forensic clinical degree at Simon Fraser University and you at the same time go to UBC Law School, get your law degree. So that would be the best scenario. There's about 10 joint degree programs in the United States. Okay, so I'm going to move to this question. What is the difference between forensic psychiatrist and a forensic psychologist? Right. Question for you guys. What's the difference? Okay, a forensic psychologist can diagnose. Okay, so a forensic psychiatrist, you said. Okay. Right, okay. Okay, so, so a forensic psychiatrist can diagnose you or anyone uh, for a mental disorder and could prescribe medication. Okay, that's one difference. Anything else? Forensic psychologist administers the Okay, a forensic psychologist administers the assessments. What else might be the difference? What did I just focus on what forensic psychologists do a lot? Research. research. Okay, so there's some differences in terms of research. What about degrees? Psychiatrists need a, a doctor, MD degree. Psychologists need a PhD. Okay, so both, I think, you said that psychologists tend to assess. Well, yes, we tend to do structured assessment, so, uh, so we tend to do self-report and, and structured assessment. Certainly, psychiatrists will do assessments as well. So, and we'll bo both psychologists and psychiatrists can diagnose someone. So I can, you know, a, psycho a clinical psychologist and a psychiatrist can go to the DSM and diagnose someone for a mental disorder or personality disorder. Both are, their goal is to help others, right, to benefit individuals, <coughs> to treat individuals. So that's what's similar. You notice my check marks for research. Certainly there's some forensic psychiatrists who do research. Uh, we have a quite well-known forensic psychiatrist here in John Bradford who does a lot of research at the Royal Ottawa Hospital. But they really receive a lot less training on research methodology, statistics, etc. So certainly that's why there's more checks under the psychologists for research. We already talked about them being medical doctors. They tend to have a physical disease model of mental disorder, right? There's some sort of neurochemical, uh, something wrong in terms of that system. And so that's what, why they tend to prescribe and can prescribe medicine, med uh, uh, drugs. Certainly in the United States, there are many states where psychologists now prescribe uh, drugs. And this is a huge debate here in Canada about whether psychologists should or should not. Psychologists tend, tend to use a psychological model. So when you read in chapter one, social learning theory, uh, 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 learning theory, that type of theory, we tend to look at the environment and the individual and physiology together to try and diagnose, assess, and treat the uh, individual. Okay, now I want you to pull out a piece of paper. I'm going to ask what, five questions. And I didn't bring a prize in. Sorry. I should have, this should, I should have made it this a, uh, uh, but anyway, I didn't. So, just put one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five on your paper. Okay, so you just have to answer, fill in the blanks. Okay, so number one, the question is, if I examine the bones of deceased individuals to determine information about them, 
Okay, so if I went and dug, you know, someone found a grave somewhere, and they called me to the scene, and I started examining these bones, and if you read uh, her novels, Kathy writes, what, uh, what would I be called? Like, what discipline? What would I, I mean, I'm a forensic psychologist, what would that be called? You can, you can ask your neighbor if you want. Yeah? Oh my goodness. Okay, we, okay, okay. Yes, you're right. Forensic anthropologist. Okay, I was going to wait to the end, but thank you. That's okay. You're, you're, okay. So everyone got number one. Okay, we'll wait to the end. Just do it in your mind, okay? Okay, expand, if I examine the spoken word or written word, let's say I work for the Behavioral Science Using Unit at the RCMP and Stephen Harper's getting uh, email threats. <coughs> and uh, there's more than one email threat, and I was trying to determine whether or not these emails were coming from the same individual writing the emails. Or let's say uh, if there was a suicide note and the investigator, the police was wondering if it's, it was fake or not. What, okay, don't say it. Write it down. What would I be? The discipline. Okay. You can guess. Okay, got that? Okay. If I uh, study dental aspects of bite marks or use dental records to identify individuals, okay, uh, I know, it's hard to see. These lights are too bad. Anyway, these are little marks. That's a teeth and that's an x-ray. Okay, what would I be? Okay, so these are all sub-disciplines of forensic that sometimes get mixed up with forensic psychology. Okay, if I studied insects, and I assure you, you didn't see any insects or reptiles in my family at home, so that's unlikely. Insects to assist in crime scene investigations. Okay, so I get called to an, uh, a crime scene and I start collecting little bugs and stuff. Okay, you can look up Gail Anderson at Simon Fraser University. Not right now, but later. She's probably the most famous individual we have in Canada who does this. What am I? Okay, one more. If I perform autopsies to determine the cause of death in sudden or unexpected death or accidental death. Okay, and there's a show on, I think it's TLC, Dr. G. Okay. You know what that is? Okay. So here are the answers. Oh, it's too fast? Sorry. Okay, well, you, okay, well, sorry, I'll, I'll slow down. But anyway, here are the answers. We already knew the number one, forensic anthropologist, forensic linguist, right, suicide notes, email, threat assessments, this sort of thing, odontologist, so with the teeth, bite marks, entomologists, studying, you know, whether or not the body was moved from one location to the next, how long the body had been left there, you know, looking at maggots and they turn into, you know, that sort of stuff. And then Dr. G is a, a forensic pathologist, right? So certainly, I don't do any of that. I certainly, those are outside my area. Okay, we have about 10 minutes to go through the history of forensic psychology. You certainly have some of this and most of this information in your book. Okay, so the first time an expert, a psychological expert, was used in court. So this is not like only 20 or 30 years ago. This was in 1896. This was in Germany. So a lot of forensic psychology came from Germany. So the first time, this was a psychologist, uh, this individual was t called to court to testify in a case of a serial murder. So this was in Munich. A man had killed three women. He was caught. He was going to trial. And there was a lot of media coverage. Now, you know, serial killing killer, there was a lot of media coverage, and the defense lawyer hired the psychologist 
to talk about the effects of media on eyewitness, uh, eyewitness memory. And what he was testifying is that we have an eyewitness to a crime or saw something happen, maybe the abduction that happened or whatever. That individual then reads about this case in the media, in the newspapers, or talks in the town or village about this case. And what will happen is what he called retroactive memory falsification. The media sensationalized the crime the eyewitness memory of the details will be modified or distorted because what he or she reads in the, meet, in the newspaper. Okay? Certainly this, is ha this happens today. Right? Pre-trial, uh, you may get a lots of media coverage. It happened in the Bernardo case, Paul Bernardo case. Lots of information in the media. They're trying to find impartial jurors. They decided to move the trial outside of St. Catharines because everyone had been uh, informed about what happened, so they moved it outside that city and had the trial somewhere else. Okay? So certainly that was the first time. Uh, William Stern started research on the psychology of uh, testimony. So he worked at the University of Berlin. Uh, he was a psychologist and lawyer. He was in a class about 100 students, so a little smaller than this class. And he was looking at, again, people's memory or recall for events. And what he did way back then is what researchers in the area of eyewitness testimony are doing now. Okay? And I didn't dare try to replicate his experiment because I think I probably would have gotten in trouble. But he wanted to make sure his experiment had some sort of reality associated with it. Okay? So what he did, he had two individuals, okay, you two, okay? So two individuals before class were confederates. Okay, we talk a lot about in psychology confederates. You're my confederate. I said something that you got upset about. I don't know what. Let's, let's assume something. You two started disagreeing back and forth, arguing, right? And they got up, so you stood up and started arguing. Don't do it. But stood up and started arguing, and definitely don't do this. As the argument is escalated, you pulled out your revolver, right? Which is a handy purse next to you. You pulled out your revolver. Now, I heard some accounts is that he... Sh that person shot a shot into the ceiling. I can't imagine the university wanting bullet holes in their ceiling, so I think they, that's exaggeration. But anyway, you're waving your revolver around. Now, before any good Samaritan could intervene, he says, okay, everyone stop. That was a staged event. Everyone sit down. I want you to write down everything that you remember. Okay, so immediate recall. Now, I promise I won't do this in this class. But I, I want to. But anyway, I won't. Anyway, so you all, they all wrote it. All these students wrote the, the information down. And what he found was that no one got it perfectly right, even though they just witnessed the event. There were always some errors in their account, maybe not surprising. The other thing he found is that in the latter part of the, uh, the dispute, particularly when that gun had been pulled, there was an increased number of errors. So he concluded that emotions, right, high emotions or emotional arousal reduces the accuracy of recall. Now, there's actually now lots of research supporting this. Right? The more emotionally aroused you are, now you can imagine if you were a victim of a, a violent crime, the less accurate your recall. The other thing that researchers have done in the last few years have looked at this issue of weapon focus. When there's a weapon in front of your face, be it a knife or a gun, you're going to focus on the weapon, not details of the individual. <coughs> okay, so that was, I mean, he was doing that sort of research way back then. He says the problem with doing research in labs, if, you don't, if everyone knows you're studying eyewitness testimony, it's a problem, right? So this is why he had this reality experiment. Uh, Verndonk, uh, this was in Belgium, and this 
really was the, the start of uh, individuals criticizing children. And we're going to talk about children witnesses. There's a whole chapter on children witnesses. This is sort of the whole start of it. A man abducted a, a little eight-year-old girl. She had two playmates with her, eight and nine years old. Uh, he abducted her. He sexually assaulted her and killed her. So these children, of course, were investigated to provide information about what happened. Right, the, the eyewitness information details. They were repeatedly uh, interviewed by the police. Supposedly, uh, leading suggestive questions were asked by the police. And this guy, Verndonk, testified for the defense in this guy's murder trial, saying that children should not be allowed to get... This, we're not talking about two or three-year-olds. These are eight, nine-year-old kids should not be allowed to give testimony in court because they're so unreliable. Okay, so he has this quote, civilized nations should never allow children to testify in court. Certainly, uh, and he did several studies to show how easy it is to mislead kids. Okay, so he did actually a, a number of studies and he presented those studies uh, in court. Okay, we have another five minutes to go. Uh, the first time a psychologist testified in a civil case, okay, remember I said civil cases, personal injury, civil suits, uh, child custody, was this Karl Marb. He was a professor of psychology again in Germany. He was hired again by a defense counsel to testify in this case where there was a, cr a train wreck. The engineer and his uh, first mate, or whatever it was called, were both drunk at the time. Okay, they were drunk at the time, they were uh, uh, under control of this train, there had been an accident further ahead on the train uh, uh, track, and he was testifying about reaction time to make the decision to throw the brake, well intoxicated or not. Okay, so then he looked at, he did studies, so he got some students drunk, put them through a, a reaction time experiment. We, we still do this now. Uh, anyway, so they got them drunk, put them through a reaction time experiment, and sure enough he found, not surprising, that if you're drunk, your reflexes are much slower. So that's what he testified, but then he testified it didn't really matter because they didn't see, the train wreck was just around a corner, so even if they had not been drunk, they wouldn't have had time anyway. So I guess the defense was pleased with this. Okay, we're going to now to North America. Cattell, in 1895, worked at Columbia University, was doing research again with the university under, undergraduates, and he was doing, again, psychology of testimony. So eyewitness testimony is sort of, remember I said it was a big field now? It is, was the first area of research back then. So he would ask his students things like, do horses in the field, now remember, it's 18, you know, going back to 1895. So I don't know if you'd be able to answer this question. Do horses in the field stand with head or tail to the wind? I have no idea. What was the weather one week ago today? Okay, you probably all would say sunny, okay. Then he would ask, how confident are you in your answers? Okay. And if I ask this question, some of you would say, yes, for sure it was sunny. I remember it was being sunny. I'm really confident. Others would say, well, a week ago? Mm, I don't remember. Okay? Anyway, what he found back then was there is no correlation or association between accuracy, getting the answer right or wrong, and confidence level. Again, this is an area where there's lots of research happening right now, the association between confidence and accuracy. Okay, we'll just do one more slide, and I'll finish off the slides on Wednesday. Hugo Munstenberg, he came from Germany. He got hired on at Harvard University. He was uh, known as the father of applied psychology. He wanted to uh, have psychology used everywhere. And particularly, he thought psychology had a lot to offer in the courtroom. So he thought psychology should be in the courtroom. People should 
uh, juries, judges, lawyers should listen to psychologists. So, uh, uh, and no one was listening to him. And he was, he was writing in ma peer, you know, popular magazines. He wasn't really doing a lot of research. But he was simply saying, yes, we should go into the courtroom. So he wrote this, article, this book called On the Witness Stand. Sort of saying, yes, use psychology in the courtroom. This lawyer, Wigmer, uh, uh, who was, uh, uh, wrote this law review article. And it's a scathing, you can actually, if you go online, you can find it. It's a scathing criticism of Munzenberg, saying that he's, way, he's going way too far beyond what psychology could offer. The, this Law Review article basically is him putting Munzenberg on the stand. He pretends it's a libel suit. Like, uh, uh, Munzenberg is uh, committing libel against psychology, so he, he pretends he's got Munzenberg here on the witness stand and it's like cross-examination. Uh, it's a fabulous article. You really should read it, especially you know, if you're in law, certainly read it. Anyway, and basically that sort of squashed the idea of wanting the psychology, psychologists to be in the courtroom. So I am going to finish. I've got about five or six more slides that I'll finish on Wednesday. But, okay, but next on Wednesday as well, I want you to read chapter two and we'll start also on police psychology. Okay, so we'll see you on Wednesday. So we're ready to start. So we're on to lecture two for Psych 2400. So good morning and good evening for those of you watching it tomorrow night on Wednesday. What I want to do is uh, I'm going to, back, to go back and finish off what I failed to finish, yes, uh, not yesterday, Monday. So a little bit more about forensic psychology introduction. Then we're going to move to uh, chapter two, which is uh, police psychology. And within police psychology, I'm going to talk about police selection. Uh, I'm going to be talking about police discretion. Uh, I've got a couple of YouTube videos, hopefully, that we can watch. The internet is down right now, but we'll see how it goes. And we're going to talk about police stress. So I realize the first week you've read chapters one, well, hopefully you've read chapter one, and you'll have read chapter two, I'll cover today. So it's heavy reading for the first week. The good news is next week all you have to read is chapter three. There won't be two chapters each week. Uh, any questions about what I talked about on Monday, the course outline, the assignments? I released the assignments so that you can do your assignments. It's under the icon assessments in WebCT. If you click on assessments, you'll see all six of the assignments there that you can go ahead and do right now. You only have one chance to do them, but I've given you five hours. If it takes any of you five hours, don't let me know. Literally, the first assignment is 10 multiple choice. It'll take you 10 minutes. Okay, the second assignment may be a little bit longer because you have to search the Ottawa Police uh, website. But literally, these assignments will not take you very long. So there's no way anyone will need more than uh, that time. Uh, I put my slides up on WebCT. Any problems downloading them? No? Okay. So are we all happy? Yeah? You're happy. You've got Timmy's, so I'm happy. Okay, so let's go back to where we were on Monday. I was going to talk about a little bit more about forensic psychology, the history. Uh, the first thing I'll talk about is uh, this Marston. He was a fellow that first developed the polygraph. And I mentioned in a couple of weeks now we're going to have a polygraph demonstration, but it goes back to 1917, was the first attempt to use physiological measures to try and detect whether someone was lying or not. And this fellow, he found a correlation or an association between increased blood pressure, okay, so when your heart starts pounding, you're more anxious. Okay, so before an exam, before a test, 
you may show some levels of anxiety, right? And one of the manifestations of that is increased blood pressure. That is not a unique sign of lying. It's simply a sign of anxiety. And the assumption is, if you're a suspect and you're hooked up to the polygraph, or when we talk about police selection, if you want to apply to work with the RCMP, they will require you to do a pre-employment polygraph. So the polygraph, you know, certainly started many, many years ago, but it's still being used today. It's being used today for suspects in interrogations, and it's also being used a great deal by police. Okay? But you might show some anxiety, and so what the polygraph is picking up is your anxiety not whether you're lying. There's no distinct uh, physiological uh, symptoms or signs of lying. Uh, the first time a psychologist, and this is in North America, was accepted in court was in the state versus driver case. And this is a case where a psychologist was asked to testify about the credibility of a sexual assault that it was committed on a 12-year-old. This is a 12-year-old girl with limited cognitive abilities, okay, so very uh, mentally challenged. And this individual said that because of her IQ, and this is the words he used back then, certainly not acceptable language now, he labeled her a moron. And because of her intellectual abilities, therefore, what she said about what happened to her this attempted sexual assault could not be believed. So this is what, you see why, remember I told you about Wigmore and saying psychologists was wanting to get into the court too soon? Well, this sort of testimony was not popular amongst the, amongst the lawyers, right? To say that something's not, or is or is not credible. Uh, we continue on to People versus Hawthorne. And this is a case where three psychologists they were not permitted to testify. The judge refused to allow them, the psychologist to testify. This is a case where someone murdered his wife's lover. Okay, so it's a threesome, right? So his wife had a lover. He didn't like that, I guess. So he went and knocked him off, killed him. Then he claimed he was mentally disordered. Okay, he was insane at the time. So his defense hired three psychologists who were going to testify, yes, he was mentally disordered at the time of the offense. The judge refused to let the psychologists testify because they were not medical doctors. They were not psychiatrists. Okay, so they were not allowed to testify. It went up to Michigan uh, Supreme Court where it was clarified that it doesn't matter if you're a psychiatrist or not, it's based on your experience, not necessarily your qualifications. Okay? So that, after 1940, that ruling, then you started seeing more and more psychologists going to court to testify. First time you see the results of research or social science research being used uh, in cases was in 1954. Uh, this is a very, very famous case, the Brown versus Board of Education where they were looking at the issue of segregation of black children and white children. Uh, the Clarks were African-American researchers, did a lot of research looking at the impact on the sense of self-esteem, confidence of black children in segregated classrooms. There was very negative impact. They uh, presented this social science research to the court, and the court then used that to challenge the uh, segregation system. And then that's where you see they, they required all states uh, not to segregate children. So uh, the last part of chapter one, so I'm still in chapter one, the last part of chapter one, it talks about expert testimony and it goes through all the U.S. standards. You know, I don't care so much if you know the U.S. standards. Oh, also, someone came up after class and said, you use a lot of dates. So like 1940, 1954. I am not going to ask you to memorize 1940 and 1954. I might ask you a question, 
When was the first time social science research was used in a case? And then I'd give you a little vignette or some, uh, synopsis of what that case was. So I never say then you would have to, I wouldn't have a multiple choice where you'd have to identify 1950, 1954, 1958. So none of that. Okay, so the last uh, part of chapter one, it talks about what about here in Canada? And there's a box about important Canadian cases. Certainly you should be familiar with the, the Canadian cases. Uh, is here, this case here was when the standard for uh, testimony for experts in Canada was established. This was a Supreme Court case. Uh, so the Supreme Court of Canada ruled on this not that long ago, right? We're talking about 1994 is when we established the rules and regulations for what type of expertise an individual must have before they appear in court to be deemed an expert. This is the Regina versus Mohan case. Dr. Mohan was a, uh, a psychiatrist, uh, no, we're sorry, a pediatrician in uh, North Bay. He uh, was accused of sexually assaulting four 13 to 16 year old patients that came to him. So during their medical exam, their physical exam, he sexually assaulted them. He was then charged with this sexual assault. His defense counsel hired Dr. Hill. Dr. Hill was a psychiatrist. Dr. Hill came in and wanted to testify that Dr. Mohan must be innocent. Nothing to do with the evidence, nothing to do with these, these uh, young women's testimony. What he said, he examined Dr. Mohan and said he's not a pedophile, although these, these youth were 13 to 16, he's not a pedophile, he's not sexually attracted to young uh, children, he's not a sexually deviant individual, he's not sexually aroused by sexual deviant, okay, and he's not a psychopath, okay, so he's, Dr. Mohan is not psychopathic. So he wanted to argue, since Dr. Mohan is none of those three, therefore, it's very unlikely, since it's only those type of individuals who would sexually assault someone during a physical exam, it would be very unlikely that he's guilty of these offenses. The judge listened to this and said, you're crazy, right? I mean, even if he was pedophile or not, or psychopathic or not, he could have still committed this offense. So there was appeal, and so this, this, uh, the psychiatrist was not allowed to testify. They took it up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that in order to be called an expert, right, so if you wanted to go in and testify, you might be able to, you might be deemed an expert, as long as your testimony is relevant to the, the decision at hand, and relevant includes that it, it needs to be scientifically reliable, okay, so you should be collecting uh, assessment instruments, uh, using research data that's reliable. It must be beyond the common knowledge. So if you were going, if I was going to testify about something and everyone knows about that issue, anyway, it's common knowledge, well, we don't need some expert on the stand, right, because the jurors can determine themselves the relevance of that. Okay, so it has to be something that is specific, that provides information to the jurors beyond their common knowledge. It cannot violate rules of exclusion. So I can't testify and say that, oh, I don't know, that you are lying. So I can't make the decision and say, suspect so-and-so or eyewitness so-and-so or defendant so-and-so is lying. That's outside, that's the judge and the jury will make that decision. So I can't make that ultimate opinion decision. So I can't testify about that. And the expert needs to be qualified. And qualified means either by experience or by education. So yes, a psychologist who is experienced, let's say in the, the realm of assessment mental disorder, which most clinical psychologists are, Yes, they can testify 
about mental disorder. Okay, so I've got, uh, I've got three cartoons, I think, today. I didn't have any last time. So here's one. I'll let you read it. 350. The average uh, expert witness in Canada gets between 200 and 600 an hour for expert testimony. So it's not a bad position to be in or job to be in. Okay, the last slide from last uh, Monday. It says, forensic, forensic psychology comes of age. And um, certainly if you were, you wouldn't even be taking this class. But Ten years ago, okay, 11 years ago, the uh, intro to forensic psych was established in 1998 here at Carleton. Okay, so 15 years ago, there would be no class. There would be no textbooks. So in your book, it talks about the signs of a legitimate field. This, you don't go, many universities, as I mentioned, Carleton, Simon Fraser have the biggest forensic psychology programs. We have six forensic faculty each. But most universities, you'll not see courses in forensic psychology. We have a concentration at the graduate level in forensic psychology. So the signs of sort of a legitimate field of psychology, are there even textbooks out there for you to, to, to read about this content area? Certainly, as I mentioned, we have one Canadian textbook. There's about four or five American textbooks and a couple of uh, European textbooks. So, yes. Uh, are there scientific journals to publish in? Right? If I do a study and it's relevant to forensic psychology, but I can't get my results published anywhere, right? there's not going to be much demand or interest. No one's going to read about it. You're not going to get increased field. There has been increasing number of journals. There's about eight or nine journals now that focus on forensic psychology, so that's good. And certainly there's an increasing number of professional associations. Okay, so the professional association is where, these are associations they meet for conferences. This is where graduate students present their research. Some undergraduate uh, students present their honors. We go there, we meet with our colleagues, we discuss the research. So right now in Canada there's one professional association uh, that targets forensic psychology. This is the Canadian, Canadian Psych Association Criminal Justice Division. And there's one American, the American Psychology and Law Society. Okay, so they, every year they have a meeting uh, between probably three and 500 people get together at these meetings. Up on the screen it, it shows you the, the growth based on psych info. So if you're doing, going to be doing a paper or, 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 or literature review for some of your other courses, you'll be going to psych info. This is a site that will cross list or cite all the dissertations, all the published research. So sim I simply went to psych info, <coughs> restricted the search between 1970 and 1980. Okay? There were 62 hits for forensic psychology. That's for over 10 years. That's pathetic. I mean, that's nothing, right? That's hardly any research being done. Then, in 1980 to 1990, about 400. Uh, 90, 1990 to 2000, 700. And then the last nine years, 1900. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, but let me give you an example from a more established field. So in the development area, some of you are probably are taking development psychology, in between 2000 and 2009, 6,000 hits. Okay, so way more research being done in developmental psychology. Uh, I can give you an example of social. Well, social psychology has been around forever. Tons of social psychology. There were 19,000 hits. Okay? And then if you think, well, maybe there's a smaller field, what about cognitive? Well, there's still 11,000 hits. So although we're growing, 1,900 hits is pretty small potatoes compared to the other fields in psychology, really. I mean, we're really quite a tiny area in the midst of this huge area of psychology. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, police psychology. And certainly the issue of how we select the police what we do uh, in terms of screening in for characters we want or qualities we want in our police officers are very important. And this is where psychology has played probably some of the, initially the biggest role. 
So certainly, if you're going to give someone a gun and allow them to go out in society, we want to make sure these individuals can be trusted, right? We give them substantial amount of authority and power. And they have substantial amount of discretion in using that authority and power. Uh, you will hear about cases of police corruption, police abuse of power. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's in the newspaper quite often, in the States often, or even in, in Canada. Police officers shoot an unarmed individual. It gets in the media. The media say, are these just a few bad apples in the group? Or do we have a whole group of corrupt police officers? Certainly, the most notorious cities for corruption in the United States. Does anyone know? Yeah? LAPD? Is, is, yes, there's three. LAPD for sure. Come on, other big cities in the United States. New York. New York. NYPD, yes. And there's one even sort of the outlier of all of them. Detroit. Detroit? Was Detroit? Yes, back in the... But not more recently. Miami. Pardon me? Miami. Miami? No. Where? I heard it. New Orleans. New Orleans was famous for corruption. They, I mean, I'll come back to it later, but New Orleans, certainly, everyone who, this was before Katrina. It was notorious. They seem to have cleaned up their act a little bit after Katrina. Anyway, so we want to screen in applicants with good qualities and get rid of the applicants with bad qualities. Uh, this is not in your textbook, this, this, uh, this table, types of uh, police corruption or deviance. Certainly the worst form of uh, police corruption would be having police officers engage in violent crimes, sexual assaults, unjustifiable homicides. Okay, so if they're en engaging in these extreme acts of violence, and they've, I mean they've been trained, they have the gun, they're using their gun, right, to intimidate people, and then they commit offenses, including homicide, certainly problematic. And certainly there's a very famous case in New Orleans of an individual, a cop, uh, I think his last name was Davis. He was involved in uh, the drug uh, sort of extortion business in New Orleans. Uh, it turns out that one, a, th uh, a woman in one of the housing project projects in New, New Orleans was sitting out on her balcony, looked down and witnesses Davis pistol whip a teenager. Right, so he was talking to this teenager. The teenager said something that pissed him off. He took out his gun and smashed the teenager in the face. Okay? The next day, she phoned the police department to play a complaint against this officer. Right? He found out who she was and the fact that she had complained. He then started talking to his partner the fact that we need to get rid of her. How dare she complain against me? So the next day, after this, they were talking about what they're going to do. They lure her out to the streets, and they gun her down and kill her. Okay? It happens, just happens, the FBI were wiretapping their phones because they suspected these two being involved in this drug extortion scheme. So they heard the entire setup. Unfortunately, they didn't intervene in time, and she was murdered by these two. Okay, so that's your extreme case. So that happens very, very rarely. I mean, this was a person going out to commit sort of instrumental homicide. Uh, denying of civil rights, according to the, uh, this is certainly is a very serious <coughs> corruption. Criminal enterprise, these are the individuals who sell drugs, stolen property, uh, engage in this sort of crime, property crimes. Right? They'll uh, come in and they'll steal property from individuals. Major bribes, five, ten thousand to look the other way for individuals engaging in, in uh, antisocial activity. Uh, tampering with evidence. I don't know, LAPD probably. You think of back then. Tampering with evidence, losing evidence, destroying evidence. Maybe refusing to testify against another crooked cop. That would in be included. Being above 
the inconvenient laws. So it's okay for a police officer to speed when off duty, right? It's okay for him or her to do that. Right? It's okay for them to engage in some, some drug use or driving well impaired when they're off duty. Taking minor bribes, you know, you get stopped by the police. Now, I wouldn't suggest you try this. But you get stopped by the police for speeding. You don't want to get any points because you know your insurance is going to go up. And you pull out a hundred, well, I don't know if you, hundred dollar bill. Right? And so to sort of see whether or not the police officer might be willing to overlook your speeding. Playing favorites. This doesn't happen so much in Ottawa, but in smaller towns, right? Where family, the police officers know family, obviously the family and friends, they know each other, so they'll let their family and friends get away with things that normally they would caught, stop people and catch them. And taking gratuities, right? The idea that uh, you stop at Tim Hortons, we, you and I all have to pay for our, our double-double whatever, our donuts and, and uh, Starbucks. They get them for free. Okay? So certainly, uh, these are the t range of issues. Now, some people have argued that this type of behavior is linked to the personality traits of the police officer. Right? We're not doing a good job at screening out Right? So we, we're letting these police officers into the force and it shouldn't surprise us that some of them engage in antisocial acts. Where others have said, well, this really is due to the whole police subculture. Right? These individuals are, I mean, the fact that they don't rat on each other, right? It's a subculture where it's very close-knit. They're not going to rat on the fellow police officer if he or she takes little money from that drug raid, uh, that sort of thing. Others have said, well, it's probably more like the interaction between these personality traits and the police subculture. And that's why we get these individuals who engage in this uh, type of behavior. Certainly, in, recently, in Toronto, 2004, right, the drug squad in Toronto, six of them were charged with 30 counts of corruption. Supposedly, they were this, this, this one unit who was uh, uh, investigating uh, the, the drug trafficking, etc., not supposedly notorious for engaging in corruption. Now, I'm saying alleged because they were charged in 2004 with 30 counts. In 2008, the judge withdrew or stayed all those charges because it took the Crown prosecutor too long to bring them to trial. Okay, they were charged in 2004 in Toronto. It was in 2008 that the trial started and the judge just simply threw out all the charges. Now, the Crown has appealed these, uh, uh, these, these uh, charges against the four. And the prosecutor claimed the reason why it took me so long is because the Toronto police were not cooperating when I asked for things. So the, the prosecutor was playing, saying, still it's this close. Yes, we charged these six uh, police officers, but we couldn't get the necessary evidence of cooperation still. Uh, here's police discretion. I'll let you read that. Pretty nasty. Okay. So it may or may not work. This is the case of this uh, Michael Dodd. Rookie, okay, this, so you can read this quote. First, I'll read the quote and then I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's a New York City uh, police officer. So he says there's all these temptations out there. Okay? So when we hit a place, we take some money to reimburse our informant payments. Right? You have informants that tell you things. You have to pay them 20 bucks here, 30 bucks there, 50 bucks right, to keep them working for you. After a while, with so much dough lying around, you just take more. If you find 10,000 or 10 grand, you, don't, you take only three or 4,000. You can't raid a drug house and come back and not turn in some money. That would be a sure tip-off. Okay? So this guy, he was hired, as a, uh, and, and he started engaging in corruption uh, right from the start. So within the first year he was hired, he started at that lower level of that table, so he, started, he was in Brooklyn, he would take free pizzas, free, free coffee, that sort of thing. It quickly moved to taking money from bodies. 
So someone would be, be dead in New York City. The police would be called. Someone's been killed. He would, first thing he would do is open up their wallet, claiming to look for ID, which makes sense, and then he would take some of their cash. Then he would put the wallet back on the body. Okay, so, you know, you, you know, they don't need the money anymore. You know, I'll take a little bit of it. He then started taking money like this from major drug busts. And we're not talking about $100 or $200. He'd be taking thousands. Okay? He also started taking some of the drugs. So rather than turning in all the drugs, he'd keep a portion of the drugs, 20, 30% of the cocaine, ecstasy, whatever. And then he would sell it on the side and make even more money. He then started recruiting other rookie police officers to work for him. So he had this extortion going, right? They would go around to known drug dealers and say, we won't target you if you give us $1,000 a week. Okay? And he had about 15 or 20 of these police officers working for him. He was making $15,000 a week salary. Well, sorry, stealing, sorry, not salary. He was making $400 a week salary. So that's what his pay was, $400 a week. He was netting an extra $15,000 a week, so $60,000 a month. And you think his supervisor would say, well, how, do you, how did he afford that fancy Corvette? How do you, why did he have four houses? Why was he flying down to Mexico and Cuba and Europe for these lavish vacations on $400 a week? No one would want to testify against him. People, the other cops were work scared of this gang sort of, of, of thugs that were working in Brooklyn. Anyway, he was, he, years and years and years he was engaging in this corruption. Finally, he started selling cocaine to high school students in Long Island. A separate police force, a county police force, investigated them, and that's how he got caught. Nothing to do with the New York City police. They didn't investigate him at all. So he got caught, and he, was, uh, he got a sentence of 14 years for the, for the drug offenses. Okay, so I want you to turn to the person beside you. So this is where you get to introduce yourself again, if you don't know this person, if you're sitting somewhere else. Given what we've heard... What qualities do you think we should screen in for in our Ottawa Police, Ontario Police, RCMP? So let's get at least five, okay? Get, write down five. So if you no one beside you, you just turn around and chat. Okay, go ahead. Okay, 
so give me five qualities. You want the RCMP, OPP? Okay, one, yeah? Honesty. Hon okay. <laughs> Given what we talked about, honesty would be a key. We don't want people who are going to, even if they're, you know, they're presented with opportunities, we want them to not fall for it. I mean, and they're presented probably with lots of opportunities, right? I mean, I try to, to get the police officer not to give me a speeding ticket, and I failed. So, but I didn't bribe. I said, look at the cute German Shepherd in the back. I said, you can pet the German Shepherd. He says, no, no, I never reach in to pet a dog because it always bites me. So I said, well, he, she won't bite you. Yeah. Pardon me? Green. 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 Yeah. You want them to have green? Oh, okay. 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 So not to be greedy, right? Okay. So the opposite of greed, you know, uh, I don't know, not greedy. Okay. Okay. Honesty and not greedy. Okay, at the back somewhere. Yeah. Uh, physically fit. Physically fit. Right. Yes. Yeah, so if you're thinking they want, you need to have them chase down individuals, and they need to be. Uh, in some sort of physical fitness. Now, I'm guessing at probably what qualities you need at the beginning of your job, right, when you're a rookie, when you're a patrol person, officer, versus when you're sort of, you know, homicide investigator and just going to crime scene, you're not really running after, right? But SWAT team, yes, definitely, you need to be physical fit. Okay, at the very back, yeah? Uh, reliability. Reliability. We want to make sure that they, you know, they deal with me and I try to bribe them, they're no, they deal with someone else, they're reliable. They're going to show up, they do their job. Yeah, over there? Low levels of uh, brutality as a child. So oh. if they were a bully or whatnot, you wouldn't want them working because they'll just be a bully in the job. Okay, so we want to screen out any uh, sort of bullying tendencies, maybe aggressive tendencies, antisocial tendencies, right? We don't want them to engage in that sort of behavior. Uh, okay. They respond well under stress. You, I, I can't, well, I can think of some more stressful jobs, but maybe not as consistent, right? Firefighters have very stressful jobs. Emergency physicians, very stressful jobs. But certainly the police, right? I mean, if you think of who the police are dealing with, Hopefully they're not dealing with us. I mean, we're, we're, we're going to be pretty polite, and right? But they tend to be dealing with criminals. They don't like the police. They tend not to be, right? So you certainly, they need to be able to handle stress, and we'll come back to what happens when they don't. Okay, uh, sure, right there? I think this shows a good sense of self, like a sense of what's right and wrong, and like, what, know what their temptation is. <coughs> okay. And like, you know, know that this job is what they want, they're not going to be tempted. Okay, so good moral principles, good sen and also good sense of self-confidence, self-esteem, yeah? Uh, not too susceptible to peer pressure. Oh, that's a good one. So not being susceptible to peer pressure. So, right, so if some, there is a bad apple, a bad rogue cop in the gang who's trying to influence you, you're able to say no. Okay, you're not going to uh, be participating. Okay, one or two more. Yeah? A uh, level of acceptable intelligence. Okay. Okay, a level, now don't say anything more if you're thinking, right? a level of acceptable intelligence. I agree. I can tell you a story of uh, a U.S. Customs officer who really did not have that level of acceptable level of intelligence. And I was kept at that border for three or four hours, and I honestly thought that I, I, wa I wanted to say, did you actually get through any college or university course? But I realized that that would... That wouldn't be such a good thing to say, so I stopped myself. Okay, the next up, yeah, right there. Uh, problem solving or quick thinking, putting them in a stressful situation, seeing how they react or how good. they... Good, okay. Given the range of uh, things that they're presented with, they need to be able to do all of this. Now, I don't know if I have all of these on there. Uh, you got those two. Sort of sensitivity, I think, is also very important. You're dealing with maybe young kids who are being abused. You're dealing maybe in domestic violence situations. You're having to disclose the death of someone to the family. Right? One of the more very stressful things to do. So you need to be able to have some sensitivity. Obviously, you need communication skills, right? In order to de-escalate de situations, you need to be motivated, right? You don't want to be so sort of not interested in policing. Someone just mentioned this problem-solving skills. Now, you certainly said not to be susceptible to peer pressure, I agree, 
But most police is done, work is done in the team sort of um, atmosphere, the drug squads, the, the vice squads, etc. So you do need to be able to work in a team. Okay, so history of police selection. Uh, it was good that you mentioned this issue of cognitive abilities. The first area that uh, psychologists were involved in was screening for intellectual abilities in police officers. Again, this goes back to 1917. So there were these, these structured uh, IQ tests initially being used with army in the military context, but then uh, Terman started saying, well, let's see whether or not we should be screening our police, uh, police recruits. At that time, he did a study of 30 police recruits. He tested their IQ. None of, okay, that's not true. Two of them had IQ level over 100. So 100 is the average in the, in, the, in the population. He found that 30% of these uh, police recruits had IQ levels of 80 or lower. Right? This is extremely low. They probably would not have the problem-solving skills, <laughs> the communication skills, right, to be an effective police officer. So he recommended at the time, this was in, in uh, California, that any recruit with IQ 80 or lower would not be a viable or a good candidate. So of the 30, 10 of them were shunted away. They were, that, they, that was the first. Then from 20s to 70s, this is where you start seeing a, a vast explosion of a whole bunch of different tests, psychological tests, uh, other IQ tests, uh, interviews, this idea of fitness. You need to be physically fit to do this job medical exams to make sure you have adequate vision, hearing, right, to, 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 to do the job. Uh, and then from 1973 onward, pretty much in North America, at least, pretty much all police agencies developed selection, uh, a selection process in order for you to be uh, deemed an eligible candidate. Even if you're selected, of course, it doesn't mean you're going to become a police officer because you have to go off to the training, right? You might fail at the training stage as well. So the RCMP, they're looking for uh, uh, the recruiting, shall we say, vigorously. There's a police crisis in Canada. They're going to be hiring lots and lots of police here in Ontario, across the country, including the RCMP. The RCMP have an eight-step sort of multi-hurdle multi process for you to become, or at least get into the Regina uh, uh, training uh, uh, school, okay? And I'll come back. I'm going to actually show you a little clip from the RCMP. Anyway, so recruitment refers to practices within an organization carried out to identify and attract prospective employees. Sort of what like, the school universities do, right? There's a university fair next week in Toronto, right? The Carleton University will have its booth to try and attract good quality students here to Carleton. So certainly the, the Police Sector Council of Canada has said, well, we need to recruit excellent police officers or candidates or recruits. So they're giving, throwing, well, they have $40 million. Uh, Craig Bunnell, who's a forensic faculty member here, is actually pre-testing some of their recruitment advertisements. Okay. So if you go online, you'll see uh, uh, Rebecca Mugford is the, per the student who's doing this. It's on Facebook. You can find it every everywhere. You can participate to screen to see which of the RCMP recruitment ads sort of, uh, uh, sort of spikes your interest, provides you with information that make, would make you want right, to apply to the RCMP. Okay, so... So I want you to just grab a sheet of paper. I'm, going to, I'm, not, I'm not involved, I'm not testing this for the RCMP. I just went on to their website. Uh, and this is the most recent video I'm going to have you watch. Okay? And I want you to tell me what are the key messages the RCMP are saying about their policing. Right? Whether it's a balanced um, overview of policing or not. Okay, so let's see if this works. I don't know if it will or not. Okay, so it's black there. If I double click, will it work? Hey, is it working? There's no sound. Oh, the sound. 
Every time I put on my red surge, I just can't help but have this feeling of pride that I'm part of this organization. For me, it was like I've seen so many kids uh, struggling with drugs, with any kind of addiction, or just not making wise choices. And I want to make a difference for those children. When you get to help other people out on the street, uh, when you get to make that arrest, that's uh, meaningful to a lot of people, and, and it brings a lot of uh, reward to yourself also. It's really inspiring to know that the things that I've done so far, career-wise, have made a difference on somebody else and have impacted the possible choices and decisions that a young person is potentially going to make and that perhaps other people have joined the force because they've looked at me and looked at my successes. If I'm able to use my skills in science and in the lab and actually be able to help investigators solve a crime or to collect a sample that will eventually identify a possible murder suspect, then that's all I could ever ask for. With close to 27,000 employees, at 750 detachments across Canada and 25 locations around the world, the opportunities are truly endless. There's something for everybody in this organization and it's just a matter of finding out what you want to do and going after it. And currently the opportunities are, are wonderful. Uh, I did five and a half years in general duty policing in two different detachments. I had the opportunities to move into the emergency response team and do part-time duties there, as well as being trained as a sniper observer. So I got some very specialized courses in terms of that. So you can be a civilian member or you can be a regular member. And the difference is the regular members are the ones you see out in the forest. They're the ones driving the police cars, carrying the guns, and actually protecting people. The civilian members are I guess you could, could say almost a support, but it's much more than that. It's everything that's done behind the scenes. Right from day one, we're given all kinds of training, and we're also provided with equipment that makes us safe. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun training, a lot of hard work. With the RCMP, you can work everywhere from a small town in Newfoundland to a large city in uh, BC. The nice thing about the RCMP is when something starts to become a little stale or monotonous after a few years, you have opportunities to move on and to do something either completely different or just move to a new detachment where you start fresh. I've had five or six different transfers since my first posting and every time you move from one detachment to another one you get automatically friends, family because everybody is from outside the province and uh, everybody is looking out for each other. I believe the RCMP is a way of life. It's not only a job, you're part of a greater family and that family is, is your fellow members. You know we, we get to do a lot of different things than most police services do. We get to carry our files which means that we work our files right from day one to the end of the conclusion. So, you know, that's a, that's a lot of experience, where in a lot of other police forces, you may not get that opportunity to do that unless you're in a special section. So, having that ability to work your files builds on your investigational skills, plus the opportunities right now within the RCMP are tremendous. So within uh, five years, I've been able to uh, go to a lot of different sections. Uh, a municipal police force, you may not get that opportunity until you have seven years. Take my career for example. I only have 11 years service and already I'm, I've been promoted to the rank of sergeant. The RCMP has funded numerous courses and has really been behind me in terms of support and combined with my efforts the past two years, I've jumped from constable to corporal and now recently to sergeant. We're looking for people that are uh, outgoing and uh, want to do the job for the right reasons. Most members of the RCMP are doing this job because it was a dream and that's what it has to be. This job has to be your dream job so that the next morning you can wake up and you're still very proud of being a member of this organization. I wouldn't be here if I didn't want to do this and I think that most people that I work with are in the same situation. In two years I've never had a day that I have not found interesting and I cannot wait to see the next 33 years of my career. For this. Okay, so I'll stop. Okay, so what what are your, what are your comments about this? What were the 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 qualities and what were they trying to present? To yeah. Um, Okay, so you want to help people, protect people, be inspired, help the community. Certainly that was a key message often when they, any of the, the uh, members spoke over the far side. Yeah? Um, yeah let's see the of the family. Yeah, I'm trying to get that back to the way of life. And so it's like your job is
you know, yeah. right? Even if you're moving to diff different detachments, it's okay because you'll have your sense of family. Even if you leave your real family be home, there'll be other RCMP officers there and they will take you in. Certainly this idea of family. Yeah? It sounded diverse and excitement, right? You saw the helicopters, the guns, they're moving around. There was a canine unit there, probably the drug unit they, they showed there going in to investigate a drug lab. So change, excitement, novelty, right? The guy at the end, I can't wait for the next 33 years, right? I mean... I, can, I don't know, I, I, I can't imagine being so enthusiastic, but that's good, I'm pretty enthusiastic at teaching, but not quite like those guys, right? Uh, yeah, that's good, so self-satisfaction, and if you're interested in new things, right, they'll pay for extra courses and programs for you. Okay, so are all of you going to run out and apply? Well, maybe, maybe some of you are already thinking of. So make a difference in the youth and community. We mentioned this. All this training, even as a civilian member, you could work. You don't have to be a, a, a police officer. You can work as a civilian member, as in one of their labs, the behavioral science unit, that sort of thing. <coughs> they went on and on about how it's an extraordinary job, right? It's uh, your dream job, this issue about being part of a greater family. You relocate, I mean, I would see this as maybe bad, but anyway, you, you often re, you get to relocate to different detachments across Canada, so up in, you know, northern Ontario to BC to maybe Labrador, etc. Your starting salary, they didn't mention, but the start, I don't think, the starting salary is 46000 uh, going into the RCMP, slightly higher than municipal uh, police forces. And, which they, and they didn't emphasize this, but the, certainly if you go to their website and you can, they do mention the fact that you will be working shifts. Okay, so this is sort of maybe the downside that they didn't present, work shifts, including nights, evening, weekends, holidays, right? So you may, and the fact that you do get uh, moved quite often. Okay, selection instruments, there's interviews. They've, they've been having interviews for many years, to, uh, and certainly RCMP, OPP will have an interview with you. They'll sit down, <coughs> uh, they will often ask a psychologist to interview you as well. They're looking for any signs of psychopathology, neg negative aspects, depression, overly uh, hostile, angry uh, attitudes, traits, uh, anxious, obsessive, compulsive, things like that, that where they want to screen out those undesirable characteristics. They also want to look for desirable characteristics that we've already mentioned. Now, in your textbook, it shows you a study showing the inter-rater reliability of interviews, and it's dismal, okay? So if I had two people in the class, and you sat in an interview, and you're rating someone for, let's say, self-confidence, right? We want people to have some sense of self-confidence in order to be able to, to do this job, right? Uh, the inter-rater, you watch the individual, you talk to him, someone else talks to him, very poor inter-rater reliability. So this is a problem, and it's been an ongoing problem with the interview-based technique. Now they've tried to get around this by being more structured, right? So asking very structured questions, closed-end questions, but still there is a problem of the inter-rater reliability. Physical fitness tests, pretty much every police force uh, uh, has a physical fitness test. There's also obviously all of them have medical exams. They also have a self-report psychological tests. The two most widely used, well the most widely used is the MMPI and it's described in your textbook. The MMPI, you'll hear about the MMPI all the time. This, this self-report scale is used everywhere for police selection, for risk assessment, for, for uh, pretty much every single topic I'm going to talk about, people have used the MMPI. There's cognitive ability, and oh, the other one is the involved personality inventory. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, that was a test specifically designed for police section, selection. The MMPI was not. So then you have cognitive abilities tests. The RCMP has this 14-item uh, police aptitude test. That's the first thing you do when you, you sign, you ask to be, um, so that's your sort of your first hurdle 
is to take the police aptitude test. See whether or not you have the aptitude to be a good police officer. Police officer. And then now some uh, agencies are doing these situational tests, right, where they put you in situations and see how you would perform. Uh, the Inwald Personality Inventory, designed by Dr. Robin Inwald in 1979, published in 1980, was developed down in Florida. Designed, as I mentioned, specifically, this is the only instrument, or the longest uh, published instrument, developed from interviews or assessments of 2,500 police officers. Okay, so it's very detailed. It's 310 true-false. So you read a statement, like any, a lot of these self-reported inventories, then you answer, is that true or false of myself? Okay, there's 25 different scales. Okay, so 310 items, 25 different scales, and this, I've just given you some examples of the scales up there. Rigidity, right? You don't want to have someone who's not uh, flexible, so someone who's really rigid in their thinking. You don't want someone with antisocial attitudes, because it might lead into what we saw before. Lack of assertiveness is someone you don't want to have. Uh, sexual concerns, you don't want to have someone with deviant sexual uh, issues. Loner type, remember we want to have someone who's a team player. Uh, family conflicts, if you can't get along with your family, one of the uh, consequences of stress with police officers is increased rates of domestic violence. If you're already having problems, the stress is going to just escalate those problems. Uh, uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, you name it. Okay, so all of these 25 clinical scales, these are things that you want to screen out for. And the involved personality inventory has been criticized really for us being a weeding out or screening out measure. Right? We just want to get rid of people with these, these or would we not get rid of them, but we don't want, these are not good candidates for police officers, so we want to screen them out. And so really, the other uh, psychologist says, well, what, really what we should develop is a screening in personality test. Right, so to screen in for good qualities rather than simply screen out. They have one validity scale. Right? A validity scale is to make sure you're not engaging in what we call impression management. Right? If you want, really want to be a police officer, it's pretty darn obvious. When they ask you these questions, have you committed antisocial acts? Do you drink every day? Are you using drugs? Right? So... Some police, I mean, someone who wants a job might engage in what we call gardenist, right, impression management, and deny these negative aspects, right? They know what they're, they're looking for. So there has been some research to determine, is the IPI, right, this, this personality inventory, a good measure? Okay, when I say something is a good measure or not, in this case, I'm not, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to ask you to do this. But in this case, a good measure should, if I give it to all of you, let's say you're all police recruits, and I, at pre-employment I give it to you, then I follow you up and see how you do in Regina, see if you pass the training and see if you're a good cadet. Then I follow you up for another year or two and see how many complaints are levied against you, see how much what your supervisor says about you. Okay? If the IPI is a good measure, right, it should have good predictive validity. So that would be a good question. Right? How would you establish the validity of a new uh, police selection instrument? You'd want to know, does it have predictive validity? Uh, so they've looked at the IPI in terms of, how, uh, uh, in terms of training, absenteeism, disciplinary actions, supervisory evaluation. And in your book, it talks about this Dietrich and Chibdell study in 2002, which, remember, there's 25 scales, right? They, they, this was a study where they followed up 108 male recruits for one year, okay? And they looked at their complaints, supervisor evaluations, that sort of thing, or, you know, conflicts with their supervisor. They only found two scales of the 25 had any predictive validity, two of the 25. One being the family conflict scales predicted conflicts with your supervisor. So you have conflicts at home, you will continue this behavior and have conflicts with your supervisor. 
And then the driving violations subscale predicted poor supervisor evaluations. So those other 23 other uh, scales did not have much predictive validity. Now, what the authors do when you read this paper, they claim, they said, well, you know why it didn't? Because it worked so well. Right? The IPI was being used to screen out recruits, so it did such a good job. We screened out all the poor recruits. We only let the good ones in. Right? So that's why it showed poor validity. So this is how Robin Inwald explains these findings. Okay? Uh, situational tests. This involves uh, giving simulated real-world uh, policing tasks. And in, your, in a box in your textbook, it describes four of them. Uh, so sometimes they're vignettes. Some there are actually simulated, where there's actually people simulating, and you go in as a police officer. As a police officer. So a domestic disturbance. Two people are involved in a death domestic disturbance. Certainly one of the more high-risk situations a police officer can get into. How would you de-escalate that domestic uh, disturbance? Right, so you arrive at the scene, you've got people who are highly aroused, angry, the police officers are called, how are you going to de-escalate this? This is going to look at communication skills, interpersonal skills, etc. Homeowner complaint. Homeowner complaint about some, I think they, they describe a vandalism. Sometimes it's a B and E. Someone's broken into my home. Uh, you arrive to take the information from the homeowner. Uh, while you're talking to this homeowner, your supervisor hands you a bulletin saying there's a high priority call that you need to get to. Let's say an armed robbery ha happening at the bank down the road. How do you then disengage from this home homeowner who's called you to come and talk to them right, about their problem? And then witness probing is like an eyewitness testimony task. Right? Someone witnesses a crime. How, what information? How are you going to interview those two eyewitnesses to get the most information? So they look to see how you, you do that. It sounds like it would be a very good way to determine an individual's ability as a police. Uh, in this one study, it found that it was a correlation of 0.14. Now, this is not very large. This is, could be, be considered a very small correlation between situational tests, the outcome of those, and how people did in training to be a police officer, and a slightly higher correlation between those situational tests and performance on the job. Okay, uh, I was going to talk, you can, you can Google this fellow, David Bram. He was an individual who was the Tacoma police chief. He was hired in 1981. In 1988, he was accused of date rape. He picked up a woman at a bar, brought her back to his apartment, pulled out his gun, and said, uh, we're going to have sex. She just kept saying, no, no, no. He threatened her with a gun. He sexually assaulted her. He claimed it was consensual sex, sexual uh, 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 encounter. So he was accused of rape. The victim had dis uh, gone to the police. Basically, they tried to cover this up. So he was never uh, charged with this sexual assault. He was promoted to the, be the police chief in 2002 of Tacoma. In 2003, after 13 years of violent domestic assaults against his spouse, she finally divorced him in 2000, uh, a couple months before. She divorced him. Uh, he was very angry and upset by this. He arranged to meet her in the parking lot of some Walmart or, or uh, Denny's or something to exchange the children for a visitation. They had three, two or three kids. He put the kids in the back of his car, pulled out his service revolver, and killed her. He then killed himself. Okay? So there was a huge investigation about his career, and there were suggestions that he was engaged in corruption right from the start of his, his uh, police career, and it was covered up, covered up, covered up, covered up. Uh, the family of Crystal Judson, uh, the woman who was murdered by uh, her ex-spouse, filed a wrongful death suit, lawsuit against the city of Tacoma. They, there was an investigation, and uh, some janitor found in behind a filing cabinet his original psychological tests. 
that when, went back in 1981, when he was hired, there was two psychologists hired to evaluate him. He was 23 years old. Okay? And these psychological tests, and this relates to, and they were, you know, it was, I don't know which test it was, it was probably the MMPI. Okay? But these psychological tests and the interview, one psychologist testified he was depressed, immature, and insecure. Not the qualities we'd want. So she said these would have a detrimental effect. So this psychologist recommended this person was not a candidate. Another psychologist, five days later, also did an interview and testing and concluded pretty much the opposite, right? Mature, stable, realistic, responsible. And said that this person would make an ideal police officer. Well, clearly they certainly hired this individual and then there was sort of a checkered history of uh, problematic behavior. But you see the problem with using psychological tests in the interview. The lawyer for the, uh, the Judson's family said these psychological tests only confirms the fact that this man should never have been hired as a police officer and certainly should not have been promoted to chief of police. Uh, there was a $75 million lawsuit involved in this. So you see how police selection is going to be key in the behavior. Uh, the family settled for $12 million. Okay. So I'm going to move to police discretion. I realize we only have about... Uh, Oh, 15 minutes or so. Uh, so certainly in the book it talks about it's impossible to cover all the situations the police officer will encounter. There are bound to be judgment involved. So we provide, uh, we allow police officers some latitude to make judgments. In your textbook about, it talks about youth crime, right? So certainly police officers who are involved with uh, adolescent offenders or kids who are suspects. There's some latitude whether or not to charge them or not. Right? There's certainly the Youth Criminal Justice Act provides them with that. Dealing with mentally Ill, Ill offenders, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Certainly with domestic violence, right? how you're going to de-escalate. Are you going to charge one party, both parties or the other party? Are you simply going to ask one party to leave for overnight till maybe they're, they're intoxicated till they calm down? And the other thing I'm, I'm going to cover is use of force situations. So in terms of the mentally ill, certainly the police have perceived that there's more and more contact in the last 20 or 30 years with mentally disordered individuals. Right? In the 1960s, we used to have many, many uh, civil psychiatric facilities where many individuals would be housed. They would stay in these facilities with the introduction, uh, introduction of psychotropic medication to control delusions, hallucinations, uh, schizophrenia. Many of these individuals were deinstitutionalized. They were released into the streets. You go to any city in North America and you'll find individuals who probably back 20 or 30 years ago would not be living on the streets. They would be living in a uh, supportive institution because they cannot cope or function in the streets. And the whole idea was we're going to save all this money because it's very expensive to have these uh, civil psychiatric institutions. We'll release them in the community and we'll provide them with community mental health care. That sounds good, but we never did it. We simply released them in the community, failed to provide them with mental health care, and then the whole idea is that these individuals now are being criminalized because of this. Uh, police have been called street corner psychiatrists, amateur social workers, because they're dealing with these uh, individuals on a constant basis. A study by Dorothy Cotton and Kingston looked at or, or, or uh, talked to 138 male Ontario police officers and looked to determine what are their attitudes towards the mentally ill. Okay. He, she found, and this was done not that many years ago, that they do not have the stereotypic negative attitude that was in the, in, people were saying they do, right? So they, at least in the Ontario police, they don't. And they believe that society should be more tolerant of the mentally ill. Okay, so they had actually very positive attitudes towards the mentally ill. So that's, that's good to think that our Ontario police do not have these negative attitudes. Uh, she also asked them about a number of different areas and she found that certainly they thought that dealing with the mentally ill in the community is part of their job. 
So 75% said yes, that's part of the job, they don't have a problem with it. <coughs> they did think, however, if the mental health services treatment was adequate, okay, if the people, the mental health system was dealing with the uh, mentally ill uh, patients, then there would be less burden placed on the police to have to deal with them. Now, that's probably true. Uh, they agreed that now they need specialized training on how to handle or deal with mentally disordered uh, individuals in the community. And the mentally ill take up more of their fair share of the police time. About 50% of them agreed with that. They're spending a lot of time dealing with mentally ill people in the community where they should be out solving other crimes. So there's certainly some sense that, well, sh the mental health system should uh, uh, do more. <clears throat> Study in your book talked about uh, research done by Linda Teplin. Linda Teplin has done a great deal of research in this area on uh, police attitudes towards the mentally ill and how the mentally ill handle confrontations with the police. So one study she found that police tend to use informal uh, uh, um, options when dealing with mentally ill. So when you get cold, someone's disrupting the peace down in the Bywood market, standing there yelling at passerbys or maybe even threatening, right, or doing something in a store, the, the shop owner calls. This is not all uh, that unusual. They may well be having hallucinations or delusions, right? So 72% of the time, this is an older study, went back to the mid-80s, 72% of the cases, the police resolved it informally. Okay, so then there was no charges, no paperwork, everyone was happy. And they give an example, ladies yelling at the neighbors, the neighbors call the police. This woman claims her neighbors, neighbors are beaming rays into her apartment. I guess they're not nice rays into her apartment. The officer tells her, I'll go tell them to stop beaming those rays. The woman's happy, the police officer's happy, the neighbor's happy because she's not screaming and yelling anymore. There's no arrests, there's nothing. So that would be an example of an informal sanction, right, consequence. Uh, transport to hospital in 12% of the cases, right, to, off to Royal Ottawa Hospital, off to the Civic, to the emergency ward, especially if they're threatening to commit suicide or harm, they will take them there. And uh, in 16% of the cases, they arrested them. Later on in 2000, Linda Teplin did another study where she followed the police around, right, she, they, they went with the police officer, there was 506 police encounters, about 150 of them resulted in arrest. So again, remember the vast majority of police encounters do not result in an arrest. Okay, there's certainly factors will increase the likelihood of arrest. And what this chart shows, a figure, right, is in the light blue, okay, those are individuals who were not mentally ill. So the, ma the majority of cases were not mentally ill, okay. So the majority of individuals who were not mentally ill, 72% did not get arrested. So the police were called, they were not mentally ill, they did not get arrested. In the case of the mentally ill, still as about 56% or so did not get arrested, okay. But if you were mentally ill, right, there was a higher likelihood, if you look over in here, right, up uh, around here, this, this, this bar here, if you were mentally ill, you were more likely to be arrested. Okay? So this study and other studies have found this as well since 2000. If you're mentally ill and the police show up, you're more likely to get arrested. Now this might be due to the fact that uh, maybe the police are trying to help the mentally ill. Maybe they think they need to get them off the street and that they maybe at the pre-trial center down in Innes Road they'll get some psychological psychiatric help, but they certainly didn't take them to the psychiatric hospital. They actually arrested them. It may be due to the fact that the interactions that occurred between the police officer and the behavior of the mentally ill person, right, it escalated. The police were asking questions, the mentally ill person did not respond to these questions or became hostile or agitated, okay? Uh, it may be that the mentally ill were more likely to be committing violence 
right? So they are more likely to be committing assault, and you certainly if you commit the more violence you commit, the more serious offense you commit, the more likely you're going to be arrested. So there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. It's not simply, oh, it's just because they're mentally ill. The police have this stereotype or stigma against the mentally ill. Okay, so I already alluded to this. What factors are related to arrest? The more serious offense, okay? So if you commit a, a homicide, armed robbery, sexual assault, stolen vehicle, you know, you're, more, you're going to probably get arrested for that. Strong evidence, right? If someone's sitting there, standing there with blood dripping down the face, the, the police officer may well say, I think an assault has occurred. This is true with domestic violence too. If they see signs of physical injury, they're more likely to engage in arrest. A victim requests the arrest. The victim says, this person assaulted me. This person's threatening me. Well, that, you know, you have a victim wanting someone, something to happen. The police are going to follow through. If the victim and the offender are strangers, Right? That person is stalking me, is following me around, yelling at me, threatening me. They're more likely to arrest that person than if you know that victim. Suspect res uh, is resistant or disrespectful to the officer. Don't do it, you guys. Right? They have a job to do. If you start being hostile, cynical, uh, aggressive back to them, they tell you to get out of your car and you say no. They tell you to put your hands on, your, on the trunk of the car and you say no. Right? They tell you to get your driver's license out and you say it's none of your business. Okay? All of those variables are increase your likelihood of getting arrested. Location of incident. Depending on where the incident occurs, if it's a high crime area, more likely you're going to get arrested than a low crime area. And uh, certainly there's racial uh, profiling happening, racial biases happening. If you're from a minority race, certainly in, in the United States, African American descent, in Canada, Aboriginal or First Nations, you are more likely to get arrested. So certainly all of these variables have been looked at to say what's the likelihood that you increase your arrest. Okay, I've got four minutes, so don't, I'm going to show you one more study, and then we'll come back to this on Monday. This is a study that was done at uh, University uh, in Colorado and he's replicated the study in uh, Chicago. This is a psychologist, Joshua Correll. He's done about 10 studies. So this is not a one-off study. He's replicated it about 10 times. So certainly this is sort of his area of expertise. So he wanted to know, this is, you know, this is the United States. He wanted to know whether police officers and community members are more likely to shoot an armed black person versus an armed white person, or are they more likely to inhibit shooting if the person is holding, let's say, a wallet in their hand or a cell phone. Okay, so he has this video game that individuals uh, play and you sit in front of the screen, and this is a shot from it, you can't really see it. This is a black individual kneeling down. Sometimes they're standing up. They're in a whole bunch of different environments. Sometimes they're holding a gun. Sometimes they're holding a wallet. Why is the lights going off? Oh, so you can see it better. Okay. Anyway, and so then you, you, you hit a button to shoot or don't shoot. Okay? And what he found is that the community sample are more trigger happy. So you guys doing this, this task would be more trigger happy than the police. Maybe not surprising. You see a gun and you're going to hit, say yes, shoot. The police are willing to make, take more time to look at the situation. But he is replicate, there is a consistent and replicable racial bias. That if the individual in the scene and in the screen is a black man, he only looked at men, he didn't look at men and women, but anyway, he's a black man, so they're more likely to shoot an unarmed black man than an unarmed white man, both the police and the community sample, and they were more likely to inhibit shooting an, uh, an unarmed white person than an unarmed black person. No, 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 they were failed, they were, sorry, the opposite. They failed to shoot more white people than blacks who turned out to have weapons. Okay, so if you're a white person with a weapon, right, 
They fail to shoot, and they're more likely to shoot an uh, 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 individual who's black. He's also now looked at African American individuals doing the task, and they're also more likely to do it as well. Okay, then, so that's the end for today. I will continue this uh, on Monday. So I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>